Welcome back to The Real News Network, coming to you from Boston, Harvard University. We're talking to Professor Howard Zinn. Thank you, Howard. Uh, thank I should you. say filmmaker Howard Zinn. Your, your movie, uh, based on your well, book, is coming out soon, uh, People's History of America. It's called, uh, tell us a plug your movie. It's called, the name of the movie is? The People Speak. The People Speak. Yeah, people go to a website, The People Speak, they will see a little, get a little glimpse of this coming film. So the, uh, our conversation has led us to the point that if there's going to be some pressure on the Obama administration, mm. there has to be some kind of mass movement. Yes. If there's going to be that, there, the only organizations I can see that have the scale and national size to create that are the unions. But the unions are, are, are to some extent split. They're relatively weak in terms of numbers uh, from where they used to be. I think only 7.2% 7, 7 of workers mm -hmm. in unions. So how do we get here? Why are unions so small these days compared to where they were? Well, I mean, we've, you know, we've had a great change in the American economy from a manufacturing economy to a service economy. And, uh, and therefore, the, the, what was the heart of unionism, and that is, you know, the factories and mills and mines, uh, they are no longer the key elements in the American economy. And the, and the American economy has become, you might say, a service and white collar economy. These are the people that are hardest to organize. They, you know, imagine, it's hard to organize uh, uh, taxi cab drivers and nurses and, and uh, uh, you know, people who do menial work and, uh, and hard to organize white collar people who somehow think they're beyond the organization. Uh, so the change in the economy to a service economy has been an important factor. And I suppose the, the other factor has been, uh, well, the, the, the administration, starting with Reagan's, remember, firing of the uh, air controllers. These, uh, the administrations, not, not just the Republican, but even the Democratic administrations, have not done what the Roosevelt administration did, was to encourage labor unions. You know. In the Roosevelt administration, they passed the National Labor Relations Act, and since then that has been weakened and weakened by the, the people who uh, are appointed to the National Labor Relations Board. And so the government itself has played a role in weakening unions. Uh, but it will take, and you were right about this, it will take a reinvigorated labor movement if we are going to have a great social upheaval in this country that can turn things around. And uh, I must say this parenthetically because you, we talk about the crucial nature of the labor movement and how you can't have a, a national movement without a labor movement. I might point out that the black movement in the South uh, took place without the benefit of trade union involvement. The anti-war movement, the movement against the Vietnam War, took place without the benefit of great union participation. So I want to make the point that there is energy beyond the workplace for the creation of a social movement. There's energy in the communities, in the neighborhoods, uh, energy among consumers. Uh, consumers have the power of boycott, uh, which is tantamount to the power of strikes in that they can bring big corporations to their knees and make the nation uh, stand up and take notice. But yes, it will take a reinvigorated labor movement. Now, what does that mean, and how can that come about? Uh, I can't say I, <laughs> I know. If the union leaders knew how to bring that about, I think, I think they would work at it. Well, as some of the problem, the union leaders, uh, one of the critique over the years has been that uh, going as far back as Gompers, where Gompers actually re represented the United States in the negotiations of the Versailles Treaty, mm. that a whole section of the labor movement you know, taking back yes. to your people's history, had, had become merged with the elite. And, and many of the labor leaders live like the elite. They get paid salaries mm -hmm. at the level of CEOs. Exactly. And so maybe, and I know you can't apply this to all union leaders because there's, there's many who are not in that category, but how much is that an issue? Now, what you say is true, and when you think about it, that is the situation we were in uh, at the beginning of the 1930s, if you look at the trade union movement then, uh, what do you see? You see the trade union movement consists of the American Federation of Labor. 
The American Federation of Labor organized a very small percentage of the American labor force. It wasn't until the CIO came into being, first the Committee for Industrial Organization within the AFL, then the Congress of Industrial Organization outside of the AFL. When they came into being, the CIO, and they began to organize all those workers who had been shunned by the AFL because they were unskilled workers, they were immigrants, they were black people, they were women. There were all these unorganized. Well, today, as you pointed out, 90% of the workforce is unorganized. They're organizable. <laughs> They're people, this 90% of the workforce are not people who are rich. They're people who need unions. They need to raise their wages. They need to be able to face their employers uh, with some strength rather than the weakness of an individual facing a, a, a corporation. So the, the, there's a reservoir of possibility there for organizing. And, you know, what will it take? Uh, I don't know. It will, take, it will take an enormous initiative on the part of maybe not the top leaders of the unions, because they pointed out there's a kind of uh, stagnation of of energy in, in some of the unions, I would in say. In some I, of the I, unions, I not all of them, but, yeah, not all of them. but uh, it, will, it will take middle-level unionists and shop stewards and people at the lower levels and community leaders uh, to set about to organize the unorganized, uh, to organize the immigrants. I mean, we have a huge amount of immigrant labor that's unorganized. And, what, and this ties in with the, with the anti-immigrant feeling that is prevalent in too many parts of the United States. It's hard to organize immigrants because there's fear there. The immigrants are in constant danger. Uh, and yet they, if organized, would constitute a very important force. So the people in the communities, uh, people who are themselves immigrants, or people whose fathers or grandfathers were immigrants, they really have to organize for immigrant rights in order to make these immigrants available for organization in a new labor force. Well, in the next segment of our interview, let's talk about looking eight years down the road. Hmm. Is there any possibility for a different kind of Democratic Party? Hmm. Uh, if we are looking at a situation where this hmm. eight years has led to yeah. what's considered unsuccessful, at least in, mm. in economic terms. Mm. Is there any opening for a, a real third party, yeah. or, or we, you think we'll still be locked into the same two-party system? Mm. So please join us for the next segment of our interview with Howard Zinn. There are times when reality just asserts itself. In spite of the haze created by television news and entertainment, Sometimes, crisis rips a tear in the fabric of myth and propaganda. Now a profound economic crisis has ripped asunder the American dream itself. Millions of people losing jobs and homes. They lack proper health care and any real sense of security. Since 2001, workers' wages have fallen and remain stagnant, even though worker productivity has risen almost 33%. By 2006, the top 1% of households we're receiving 23% of all pre-tax income, more than double what it was in the 1970s. It's the greatest concentration of income since 1928. As unemployment rises, we need to know why this crisis is happening and what we can do to defend ourselves. Why are wages so low? Why is the society so laden with debt? Is it in ordinary Americans' interest to have a trillion dollar military budget to project power across the globe? Corporate television news won't ask these questions, let alone try to find answers. Only a truly independent news network can tackle these questions with courage and with ordinary people's interests in mind. We need a news network that's independent of corporations, governments, and political parties. We need the real news. But there won't be a real news network unless we raise substantial funds right away. The current financial crisis has hit our funding hard. Together. We do have the power to turn it around. There are already hundreds of thousands of people watching the real news every month. If everyone pitches in, we can build an internet and cable television network that will change the face of media forever. You can organize house parties, talk to friends at school and at work, 
Send email blasts and spread the word. Distribute this video to everyone you know. Pick up the phone and call a few friends and suggest they visit therealnews.com. Invest just 10 minutes a day to ask friends and colleagues to join the campaign to create a truly independent source of internet and television news. Together, we can build this network. Just 50,000 people at $10 a month gets us to our first level of sustainability. You can help us reach this goal, and when we do, we'll move to television in millions of homes across North America. Help us reach an audience in the millions. Please contribute generously. Spread the word. Let's make the Real News Television Network a reality. Your tax-deductible donation makes it possible. Please contribute at therealnews.com.